quid pro quo. However, if there is a dog, then it is not the case that if there is not a horse, a mailman will not get bit. If dogs and horses are mortal enemies, then dogs hate horses. Horses hate dogs and horses ridden by men once delivered letters. Therefore, postal workers do get attacked by dogs. It stands to reason horses are made out of glue or vice versa. And if glue is then made from horses and dogs and horses are mortal enemies and Hermes, who also was Greek like Atlas, did not stand fixed to be bit but delivered watery messages of forgetfulness to a three-headed dog set to slumber by shoes that flapped like mail slots, then dogs can smell horses in the mailman's letter sack on the glue of the envelopes. All dogs are genetically predisposed to bite postal workers who smell like horses. Therefore, postal workers should be allowed to carry dog biscuits. It's about as light as it gets, so. <laughs> uh, there's probably, there might be a couple of other lighter moments. I shouldn't, I shouldn't lie. Um, Mix it up a little bit. This is another kind of newer poem. Hmm. Grab this here. Sometimes one of the things that I'm, I'm kind of, uh, I've been talking to area high school students this week about poetry, and one of the things that I tried to tell them is that poetry does not have to rely upon traditionally uh, what is traditionally conceived as poetic content. Poem can be about anything. And it can be something so quotidian or commonplace as and something that we ignore, take for granted every day, at, such as being at a Waffle House in Virginia, for example, and being cognizant of the fact that there are flies kind of uh, intermingling in your mist. <laughs> let's say, and uh, it was just one of those weird things uh, that I happened to take notice of, and I wanted to write a poem about that. And it's called, it's a play on, if you're familiar with Whitman's work, he has uh, The Dalliance of the Eagles, which is kind of one of his later famous poems. And um, this is a, a poetic play on that, uh, using the image of the flies instead of the eagles. And it's called uh, The Dalliance of the Flies at a Waffle House in Virginia, after a theme by Whitman in the style of Ginsburg. Above the honeycombed batter, the flies in end of July heat, between sips of water and coffee, I am humbled in Virginia by old glory of amative burst tumble, the bliss that distracts also from side order hash brown patty. Two black stars in coital galaxy, thermal pressure before ebullient swell of collapsing mass. The flies in rapt ignorance of gravity plunge toward another earth below, where I sit, diner booth shade, forgiving the unsanitary spectacle, union of germs, unshaven limbs. Do the waitresses ever pause to witness the luscious iridescence commingling, the stellar birth that brings the pangs of failed equilibrium of stellar death? As I dwell and wait for the check, one lover drifts from the other, lands orgy warm upon the cracked tabletop, rubbing forelegs back to ugly. Still life waffle house with dalliance of flies. I gather my laptop bag and sunglasses, head to the airport, abandoning the seven cities. Patrons behind me, unaware that from their forks, they chew the unknowable sex splash of each other, the white noise of nearly silent wings that carry from zenith to zenith our microcosmic dust. I guarantee you, you will never look at flies the same way again after that. After that. That's the, about the only guarantee I can leave you with. Um, this is another poem about just watching and taking stock of the obvious and the power of the commonplace and of the obvious. And uh, it's a poem, this is it's a, a real person back in Indiana, Pennsylvania, whose name is George. I don't know his last name. And George always comes to this shop and he's by himself. And I often 
try to put myself into the, the shoes of other people to imagine, you know, what is leading, wh why are they by themselves? Why are they at this place? You know, what is it about them? And I wanted to kind of give visibility to this. And it's, uh, it's a poem called Watching the Man Watching Traffic. And if you're familiar with uh, the Great Gatsby, for example, there is um, an allusion to that book in this section, in uh, um, the first part of this poem. A couple stanzas in. And it's just very simply entitled, Watching the Man Watching Traffic. I know him casually, he and I of head nod and small talk. This afternoon he came to the cafe the day before Halloween and left a peanut butter cup on the table. I thought you could use some chocolate. George arrives every day like this, alone. The regulars greet him and he them. Sorry, we're late today, George. You are late. Got everything worked out? Oh, we're not solving problems, we're just enumerating them. The entrance and egress, an indefatigable drivetrain. Cars like people, also like years like cars. And George sits silent now, arms crossed, watching stoic, an old Eckelberg, this felled billboard of flesh at ground zero, watching in the shadow of the valley of the ashes. The bright orange vest draped over the back of the plastic chair. I say to myself, this is autumn. What did we miss, George? Hmm? Oh, just a bunch of cars going by. There's always cars going by, George. I watch the back of this lonely man's head, the occasional scratching of the ear. He sits closely facing the floor to ceiling corporate panorama, observing the destinations of the faceless, dreamless. He, the white-haired sentinel of small town, Lethe, thoroughfare. Oakland Avenue, the cars pass before him, the over and infinity loop of over again, 1 p.m. noiseless caravan of sports car, sedan, college jalopy, minivan, pickup truck. A black semi-rig pulls into the parking lot, better sleep through science. Must be important. George and I often sit here silently, living some part of each other's life. The baristas say hello to George and then to me as they arrive for their shift. And the cars continue like years to pass just beyond the tempered cinema. It's later than I think. The grass outside, I watch the leaves bluster as motes through the edge of George's bifocals. The world so much smaller in these moments, blurry in those hard teardrops. So how's everybody holding up? Are we all right still? Usually with poetry readings, I try to keep it, usually they tend to last a lot less than an hour. So, because most people can't tolerate poetry for longer than half hour clips at a time. So, I mean, I'm, I'm free to go on. I have enough energy drinks, as I say, to power a South American village. I have a question. Sure. In the uh, in high schools nowadays, um, what, in English classes or something, they teach poetry, or is that taught at all anymore? <sighs> it's a really good question. Um, Here's what I can say because I, you know, I teach at, at undergraduates at the university level. And I've heard this from other people as well who are working in the field. The students are coming to us less and less prepared, literarily and on a worldly level, and historically. There's a real sense of historical amnesia as well. And I think part of that historical amnesia is filtering into what is being taught vis-a-vis -vis literature as well. So in terms of uh, most of the uh, most of the young people I'm meeting today, they just they're not interested so much in learning about poetry, and, and in a lot of cases they they're already coming with kind of preconceived notions of what poetry is. So I tend to think that if they are exposed to it at all at the high school level, it's 
the students I'm dealing with anyway, and I can't speak you know, beyond that kind of microcosm where I am, but many of them have no understanding of the tradition of poetry, where it comes from, who are some of the kind of quote unquote canonical poets. Um, so it's, it's more and more it's becoming, you know, it's, in this country it's very marginalized. One of the things that 